Hello, welcome to another Perusia podcast. I'm Shabal Reish, your host, and I am thrilled to welcome back a very good friend of mine and the host of the of the Stations of the Cross that we've been journeying through in Lent, in this Lenten, in the Lenten pilgrimage leading up to Easter. We did this uh, last year and we're rerunning it again this year. And we thought it might be uh, very fitting now um, as we are in Holy Week to be able to share with you um, uh, a sort of a summary and a bit more of a background about the stations, what they are, how they started, and, and a little bit of some reflections and things. Uh, none other than the man himself who's traveled the world literally and goes on pilgrimage. He's our pilgrim guide, uh, Steve Ray from CatholicConvert.com. Hello, Steve. How are you doing? Hello, Charbel. Doing good. Just got back from Italy with 41 people doing the saints and shrines of Italy all the way through the country. And now we're going to um, Israel with 57 people in a week and a half. First time back in two years, they finally opened up again. And Praise we're one God. of the first oh. ones in. Well, oh, it must be so good to, uh, you know, have everyone back uh, and be yeah. on pilgrimage again. I'm looking forward to it, to Israel, yeah. especially. I mean, we've led 80 groups through Israel. Now two years oh, wow. of dead. Now it's open again. Wow. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, it's good to have you. That's what you do best. Uh, um, everyone knows you, <laughs> Steve Ray, the footprints of God and, and the way you've, you've traveled. Um, that, by the way, is still on the cards, right? You've got one more to go with the footprints of God series. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Doctors of the church, defining wow. Wow. the faith. Wow. It was supposed to be done in 2021 or this year, but you know what happened. We got sidelined yeah. and now I've got to get it all rescheduled and uh, write the script for it and get ready to go. So probably 2023 and we'll have okay. all 10 done. It'll have That's been a fun. 25 year project by the time we finish. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I'm, I'm still praying and hoping we can, um, we can bring some Aussies uh, in mass uh, to your pilgrim pilgrimage to the Holy Land one day, uh, maybe in a couple of years or down the track, but I'd love to, to see if we can get a busload of, of Australians, if not two, uh, uh, to join you. Uh, yep. You know, we had hoped to do it this year or next year, but I have such a backlog of people yeah. now that we had to postpone that are now filling up the next two years of trips. Wow. wow. It's very complicated. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> well, one day we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. I, I wanted to, um, yeah, dive in today. Um, we are at the time of the, you know, this show will be released. Uh, we're going to be in Holy Week. We're leading up to Good Friday. We've um, got Easter around the corner. Um, and we've just been journeying with the 14 stations of the cross plus the 15th one, Resurrection. Uh, and you did this for us last year and we're rerunning them again um, this year. And they were just so touching and, and um, the reflections were just powerful. Uh, and I want to thank you again for that. But can we dive in just a bit of a background about the stations in general sure. today? Um, and I want to ask this off the bat, why did the Stations of the Cross begin, this idea of the Stations of the Cross? Well, I'm going to show you this first. This is called a hand cross. And when we go in two weeks on the Via Della Rosa, the Stations of the Cross are real ones. Everybody gets one of these olive wood made from Bethlehem and they carry them in their hands. And this one, for example, we, my wife always brings several of them to give away as gifts. This one, we get up at 3.30 in the morning and then start the Via Della Rosa at four o'clock in the morning. Nobody's even awake yet. Wow. We got the whole streets of Jerusalem to ourselves. When we get to the Holy Sepulcher, it just opens and no one's there. So we carry this through the stations of the cross as we pray them through the streets of Jerusalem, the route that Jesus took. Then we go first to the top of Calvary inside the church and everybody puts them down under the altar. There's a hole under the altar and you put them way down about up to your elbow and you can feel the rock. And I tell people why they got their cross down there. If you had touched that spot right now, 2000 years ago, your hand would come up sticky with his blood because that's where the cross was. You're touching wow. where the cross was set in the rock there. Wow. And your hand would come up sticky with his blood and the cross touches this. Then we go down and we have mass at the tomb. And we get most of the time we're able to. Like probably now it'll be easier because there won't be the crowds now. Uh, but everybody then on the trip also touches the top of the tomb where Jesus laid with us. So when you bring it home, it did the whole stations of the cross, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And people really love this. They, they use this to pray. I, the other day I was at a conference and someone pulled it out of his pocket. And he says, look what I carry in my pocket everywhere. So wow. anyway, that's just a that's little powerful. introduction. No, 
why did the stations of the cross begin? Well, because we know that Christ walked those stations from Pilate's um, praetorium to the site outside the city gates where the people were crucified. Now the church is inside the walls and the Protestants, they say, the Holy Sepulchre is not really the place because it's inside the walls. It said Jesus went outside the walls to be crucified. So you Catholics got the wrong place. But they didn't do their homework because in 44 AD, they moved the walls out. And so what was outside is now inside. And the Church of the Holy <laughs> Sepulchre is now inside. And that is the real place where it took place anyway. And, and I can show you that. We can show you where the old walls were. And it's outside the old walls. But anyway, that's another topic. So people went, the very first pilgrims, we have records of them actually. I have a book called, it's all of the earliest pilgrims that went to the Holy Land in, in, in the first centuries. And for example, Justin Martyr, uh, was born in Nablus, which is Samaria. So he was from there and he ended up in Rome converting. And he said that people come there to see Nazareth, even to see some of the things that Joseph and Jesus had made. I guess that his family in Nazareth was very proud of the fact that they were the family of Jesus and Joseph and Mary. So they would collect the things that Jesus, whether it was true or not, I don't know, but Justin Martyr assumed it was true. And they went to see those. And, and John Chrysostom, doctor of the church in 395, said, even at this late date, pilgrims come to see the place, the cave where Jesus was born. 395, he said, even at this late date, right? Little did he know that Steve Ray would be leading thousands of people there in 2020, 21, 22. So anyway, <laughs> and people went there and they came back home and they wanted to relive it in a sense they wanted to share it with their back the people back home and to kind of the reliving and sharing of the suffering of christ during holy week and that's how it got started is um it's just people wanted to you know once you walk the stations oh let's say for example we pray the rosary we're praying all of those locations right you're praying about the visitation well that happened in a place and when we take our groups, we pray every mystery where it happened, except the yeah, last uh -huh. one, because you can't pray that one. That's the coronation. We're not in heaven yet. <laughs> but all the other ones, you can pray where they happen. And so people pray the rosary. So what you're doing is you're actually praying the places. You're looking at the life of Jesus through Mary's mm -hmm. eyes and visiting, in a sense, and mentally and spiritually, you're visiting those places. Well, they want to do the same things with stations across. Easter came. It was a great way to teach kids, right? You get to teach kids. Kids, you tagging them along. They're wiggling and squirming. You got kids. You know what it's like. I got Absolutely. 19 grandkids. And come on, why are we doing this, Grandpa? Why are we doing this? Because this is what Jesus did. We're going to. And, and it's just like Passover. When the Jews celebrate Passover, it even says, in the book of Deuteronomy, your children will ask you, why do we do these things? And Moses says, then you will tell them about the great Passover of the Lord. So it's a way of reliving it. It's drama. It's, it's putting ourselves right in the story. We're in the drama of it again. And praying the stations of the cross, you really shouldn't think, well, I'm trying, I'm remembering something 2000 years ago, but you should put yourself right in the drama, right in the story right now, feel it, hear it, smell it, hear the birds singing and the people groaning. I, so people wanted to relive it. They wanted to have that experience of living Christ's life with him, meditating on Christ's life, meditating on his sufferings and being a part of it. So they brought it back home so they could relive it and share it with family and their parishes on Holy Week. And now it's spread. It's I think it's in every church. Yeah, wow. Wow. Um, this is interesting because we know of the 14 stations. How did we get here? I mean, how did the stations actually begin in that sense? Well, there was there was it took a while to standardize it. Now, in every church, you have 14. I think there should be 15 because I don't like leaving Jesus in the tomb. I just I just don't think that's where we should end it. But anyway, that's what it is. It's 14 stations till he's buried. There were no it wasn't standardized at first. It, there was as many as 11, a few as 11 stations and some had as many as 30 stations. And even today, even now, 
um, Pope Benedict, I think, was praying the, the biblical stations where he had a different set. So there's always been different configurations, but it did get standardized. I got right here written down that it was probably standardized by the Franciscans in the 14th century. And okay. then Pope Clement the 12th in 1731, he kind of made it official. There's 14 and these are what they are. But through time, there were all kinds of them, anywhere from 11 to 30 stations, sometimes including the resurrection, sometimes not. The whole chapel devotion began with St. Francis. We were just at the Church of St. Francis in Assisi about eight days ago. And he's the one that first started the crush scenes, you know, the manger scenes that people yes. have on their dining room table during Christmas. Francis, St. Francis was the one that started that. Okay. That's why it's got so many animals in there, you know, St. Francis <laughs> likes the animals. And so you have him starting that. He went to the Holy Land and when he came back, he wanted, he started the little chapel, the little uh, manger scenes, the crush scenes so that families could picture it. And, um, I remember just, I'm off track here, but my mom said to me, Steve, when you become Catholic, you're going to keep Jesus on the cross. And he's not on the cross. He's in heaven. He's risen from the dead and he's in heaven. But you Catholics keep him on the cross. He's not there anymore. Well, she had the little manger scene on the kitchen table. And I says, mom, he's not in the crib anymore either. So I <laughs> gave my mom a hard time. But anyway, so there was no standardized. It was, it took time. But and, and the fact is, nobody really knows where those stations are because, you know, we know where it began and where it ended. So, okay. what are the stations? And um, as we go along, we'll see some are in the Bible and some are just not in the Bible, but they're common sense. So, yeah, there was no, no standardized until the Franciscans in the 14th century pretty much did it. And then Pope Clement the 12th in 1731, I have written here, he's the one that pretty much standardized it. We've been praying the same stations of the cross ever since. Yeah, beautiful. Now, there are different names that we call the stations. What, what are yep. those names? Different languages. Uh, yeah, do you know okay. Lebanese? Do you know Arabic? Absolutely. A little bit. <laughs> how, do you say, how do you say stations of the cross in Arabic? Uh, Darb Salib. See, now there's a name for it. That's one yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> and Spanish people would have another name for it, and the Russians would have another name for it. But it has in Greek, Via Dolorosa, the Saros. The sorrow, the walk, okay. the via is the road, the way, the way of sorrows. We call it in English the way of sorrows or the stations of the cross. And in Latin, it's via crucis, crucis meaning cross, okay. the way of the cross. So it has different names. And I, I like learning the um, Arabic one, but I don't think I'll remember that. But it was <laughs> nice to hear. So it does have different names. It's known, um, but it's usually the stations of the cross. The via, and when we're doing it in Israel, it's the Via Dolorosa because it's that's the signs. You're following the signs of the Via Dolorosa, and each one of the stations we come to, most of them have a marker like the Roman numeral one, Roman numeral five, and some of them have little images. And if you don't know where they are, you're not going to find them. You have to, you know, somebody like me who's done it a hundred times. Um, you have to know that. Now, you may ask me, Steve, when you pray the stations of the cross, what church do you go to? You know, I cannot remember the last time Janet and I prayed the stations of the cross here at home. I know that we did a long time ago when the kids were young. We went to an outdoor one. And I know in the Lourdes, they have them outdoors. And a friend of mine oh, that yes. I did a conference for him, he's got a pond. And he made beautiful stations of the cross all the way around the pond. So him and his wife, and he opened it up to all the subdivision neighbors. They can all come and they walk around and do the stations of the cross around the pond. And I know in Montepello, where we just were, it's up on the side of a mountain where the face cloth of Christ is. Oh, wow. And we'll get to, we'll get to that probably in a little bit, too. But on the way up from the village, they have the stations of the cross all the way up to the church there. So they pray it as they go up to church for mass. But I can't remember, to be honest, and this is um, I'm probably scandalous. People will be scandalized by this, but I can't remember the last time I prayed the stations of the cross in a church because Janet and I do it so many times of the year in the actual place. It's kind yes. of it's kind of anticlimactic in a way to, <laughs> to walk around a church, you know, and pray them in little because when you're there it's so much more dramatic and real because you're in the actual place i mean would you rather be at a at a football game or looking at pictures of a football game in a magazine i mean it's a big of course, difference. the experience <laughs> says it all can you can you paint the picture for us then like you said uh we know where it begins we know where it ends but 
But what's it like on the journey over in the Holy Land? So sort of how far apart are the stations? What 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 is all that experience like? What can people expect? Yeah, it's it's maybe maybe between a half a mile and three quarters of a mile. Okay. I know most people that may be talking are thinking uh, kilometers. Um, let's say that it takes, depending on how long you stay at each station to pray. Say it, if you stop at each station and pray for three minutes yep. and then move on. And then you all kneel and say, you know, we adore you, O Christ, and we bless you for by your cross you have redeemed the world. And say it takes three minutes and you can pray the whole station in, in a half an hour and get to the Holy Sepulchre. But once you get in the Holy Sepulchre, some of those stations are inside the church, like taking off his clothes and um, nailing him to the cross and hanging. Okay. Uh, those are done. You have to do those right inside the church, which then it gets kind of difficult because on a normal day, it's full of people. Those who try to do it during the day, I feel sorry for them. They don't get any kind of a devotional sense at all because they're basically getting pushed around by crowds and yelled at. Yeah. But the best time to do it, we, I'll just give you our experience. We get up at three 30 in the morning and everybody says, are you crazy, Steve Ray? You could kill us. He's, this is Steve Ray's torture tours. <laughs> it's the only day we get up that early, though. But we, we do it. And then at the end, they said, Steve, that was brilliant. What you did was brilliant. And I always say, don't, you'll thank me later. You'll thank me yes. later. So <laughs> my guide, Amr, and I and Janet, we get them all up, load them on the bus when it's still dark. We drive around to Herod's Gate, which is going into the Muslim quarter on the north okay. side of the walls of Jerusalem. And then we have to walk a ways, go up some stairs, walk. And it's and it's, we always tell people whisper because there's 180,000 people that live in those walls. It, it, in the old days, when I used to run every day, I'd get up in the morning and run around the walls of Jerusalem. It's two and a half miles. Wow. And within that two and a half miles, there's 180,000 people that live in there, in the apartments and the houses above restaurants and shops. And so yeah, we wow. try to be quiet and they bring their flashlights because it's dark in places. And um, be careful because the streets aren't level and there's steps and things to trip over. And all of a sudden, meow, a cat runs in front of you. <laughs> so I'm just trying to give you the feel of the real thing. All of a sudden, yes. you smell bread breaking, baking, and you look and there's a doorway. You wouldn't even know it. And down in there's a big ovens and the guys are throwing dough in there and pulling out the bread and they're getting ready to deliver it. So all of the stuff you see in the dark as you're walking along, we finally get to the place where the Antonia Fortress stood. And that was massive. Nobody knows exactly where it stood, but it was massive. And we say that this is the place where they brought Jesus early Friday morning. And this is where the stations begin. And we talk about where we are and how it began. And then Jesus begins his journey. He's already been whipped. He's already been tortured, like we saw in Mel Gibson's movie. Yes. And now he's starting on this journey. Now, we don't know exactly where the stations are because everything has changed in Jerusalem from the time of Christ. I mean, this building got torn down. They built another one, moved the street oh, over yes. here. And everything is about nine feet above the level of Jesus. So in other words, things, the walls fall down and debris, and pretty soon it raises up and up. So when we're walking, actually the footprints of Jesus would have been nine feet below and underneath. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. And there's a few places where you can actually see the street, you know, where they've dug down and you can go under churches and see that. But we're actually walking nine feet above where his feet were trod on there. And so we know that we got to get from the Antonia Fortress here to Calvary here. So the stations are pretty much uh, man-made in a sense, I would have to okay. say. But we know point A and point B, and there are 14 stations in between. So we, the, we, the route is marked out. And um, when you get to the third station, you see Mary and falling down and Mary coming. And they got a little um, emblem there on the wall with a big number, you know, um, let's see three and four we hit there and then we get in the and so we're wandering through these streets of jerusalem and the little shops are starting to open and some of the old guys are sitting there already playing chess and smoking their the water pipes as we're going by and they say hello and a bunch of muslims are hurrying off to go to pray at the mosque and the jews are hurrying to go to the western wall and pray and it's all there are those that are early risers that are going in the streets but very few very few christians are not up yet so we are working our way through the streets. And I'll tell you, one time was very interesting. It was at Easter time, and we were sludging through two or three inches of slushy snow. Oh, wow. It had snowed that night. And then we realized Jesus could very well have been hanging on the cross in a snowstorm. 
because we've been oh. there in the spring in March or early April when there were snowstorms and we were slushing through everybody's feet were freezing because they hadn't come prepared with galoshes or boots or whatever you call. It. And so our feet were soaking wet and cold, but we're wow. thinking Jesus could very well have been carrying his cross through slushy snow too. We don't know. Yes. Yeah, so it's the end of winter. It would have been the end, it is of, winter. end of winter. Right. Oh, and, okay. it, and it only snow and it snows. We've been in many times. I had snow fights with the kids in Bethlehem once just for fun. You know, they're all throwing snow. I got off the bus and I was out there trucking snowballs. And so it does happen. But, wow. and, and so we, we walk all those stations and then the church just opens and we come into the courtyard of the church and we pray a station there. I'm always in a hurry to get the group to move, though, because I want to get them up to the top of Calvary before any other groups arrive. I don't yes. like lines. I hate lines. And I have <laughs> my guide and I have worked really hard to learn how to avoid lines. It's one of the people who come with us because, and we get there <laughs> early and we all go up and line up on top. It's got to be quiet. The Franciscans are, are, are getting kind of rousing in the morning and so we go up there and there's one or two nuns up there. That I don't know if they've stayed there all night or not, but they're up there. They just, they're like, um, not moving. They're just praying. They gotta be careful. You don't trip over them as you're walking up the <laughs> stick and the stairways go way steep. And you can see where millions of people, the steps are all worn down. So wow. it's, it's almost hard to get up there because they're all uneven. And so then everybody gets in line and you see over here on that one side of a, a mosaic and it's of Abraham's offering his son Isaac yes and you say why did they put that there well remember that on this same place another father Abraham who had an only begotten son whom he loved offered him on the top of Mount Moriah now we're there 2,000 years later another father with the son whom he loved Jesus he offers him there so they were smart they put that up there to say this is typology this is a picture of what's happening here and there's the ram get the ram pull him out and slaughter him yes, so jesus right. is the new lamb and then you see a, a, a in another place that so this is and it also you got to remember that this church is owned by six different traditions the armenians the greeks the catholics the oh, coptics wow. and they all fight over their territory and they have rights as to when different groups can have different real estate okay. nothing is more fought over real estate in the world than that inside that church so we go up and the place of the cross is owned by the greek orthodox oh, interesting and the place where they strip jesus of his clothes that altar is owned by the roman catholics so at that altar a lot of times we have mass there at calvary on that altar but you see jesus having his clothes ripped from him and being nailed to the cross. And then we move over and I get everybody in line and two by two, usually couples, they go and they take their crosses and they reach down and touch the place where the cross was. And they come up and I guarantee that half the people have tears in their eyes. I half imagine. of them are, white, are just sobbing or wiping tears from their eyes and thinking of what that happened. And you can even see Calvary, you can see the cracks in the rock. It's that the rocks cracked and you can even see that there. And there's this beautiful image of Mary in a glass case. And there's a big sword going through her chest. Oh. And you can see her, she's like, she has this look in her eyes of fear and pain, but also of total trust. It's a very unusual, whoever made that image of Mary, it's a statue inside a glass case is really is interesting. And the, and the sword's going right into her chest. The sword will pierce your soul also, Simeon had told her. So then we, after everybody touches Calvary, then we go down and we have time for a tour because you can't start mass until a certain point. And so we have planned an hour now to go on a tour and my guide, Amr, and I, we take everybody and we finish the stations praying them along the way. And we also, because we're praying the rosary, we finish up the rosary um, mysteries that take place in the church in those places. And then normally what we do is have mass in front of the tomb because we have bigger groups. So you can't get everybody into the tomb. You can only get like 20 people in there for mass. If you have a small group, you can go in there and have okay. mass. They close the doors and you're right in the tomb. Is that, that is that right there? I'm, I'm curious, how far was is Calvary to the tomb? What's what's if, the sort I, of if I would take steps, it'd probably be 40 steps. Oh, wow, very One, close. Two, three, walking right there. And there's Calvary. They took him down off Calvary and they put him into the side of the hill. It's all right there under one big dome. 
Wow. Okay. One big church. And we know that's the case too. I'm not going to go too much into that. The Protestants have their own place called the garden tomb, which is a joke actually. And um, it wasn't even suggested until 1850s. And everybody knows that the Holy Sepulchre is the place, archaeology, yeah. history, <laughs> pilgrims from the graffiti. The, I mean, it, it is the place. There's just no doubt about it. And everybody knows where that tomb was and where Calvary is. So normally what we do then is after the tour, showing everything in the church, and it takes time and it's dark, and you can trip easy because every, I think they're going to redo the flooring, their two-year project they're starting now. I, I kind of like the old way. I like it, the old dark um, cobblestones inside of there. It's nothing like it. Protestants don't like it because it's dark and there's oil lamps hanging and they can't do anything. They can't sing. They can't do their little Protestant yeah. services in there. So they don't like it. So they got their own place down Nablus Road. Anyway, then what we do is we the Franciscans set benches up in front of the tomb. And then the Franciscans come out and they sit on their rows of benches and the organ starts playing. And our priest with the Franciscans go inside the tomb and they, they do all the consecration. They come out to read the gospel and back into the tomb. And you can't hear them in there. Not unless you've got a priest who's really loud. We had one who was really loud and you could hear him in there. The Lord be with you. And then we knew when to say, and with your spirit. But sometimes you <laughs> don't, if he's a soft, and sometimes the priest is crying, especially if it's his first time, he's crying and trying. And so it, it's one of the strangest masses people go to, but it's yeah. always every every day it's the easter mass from john chapter 20 even if it's a tuesday or a thursday whether it's june oh, or july okay. it's always the resurrection mass of easter morning that you pray there it's always john chapter 20 that they ran to the tomb and so then he comes out to with the behold the lamb of god and goes back into the tomb again and then he comes out with the eucharist and we all take it an organ is playing and they hand out latin we all sing in latin and then the mass is over and we all go back to the hotel, walk away back to the hotel and have breakfast. That's the morning. Just kind of give you a quick tour yeah. of what I'm going to be doing again in three weeks. I'm going to be doing that again with people in three weeks, taking 57 people through the streets and giving them their little cross and doing that whole video. So that, that kind of gives you the idea of it. Now, back in the time of Jesus, obviously, it was very different because he's walking through those streets at um, noon. And he's nobody cared about him he was just a criminal he's going with the other criminals he's been convicted mm. now a lot of people lost interest in him and so just dragging him through the streets and the, you can just see the guys in the little markets get him away from my skin blood all over my tomatoes get him away from the kids. yeah you're blocking my front of my store would you because they're they're taking these criminals on but you don't want to be too critical of the roman soldiers because they'll grab you like they did um oh, really Simon tight, the Cyrene. tight streets you know, yeah really it narrow would be, it would be yeah. narrow streets and it, they didn't have cats back then i don't think but the, the, the cats now are running around between your legs and people are riding bikes along and knocking into you and this is why we do it in the morning don't tell yeah. anybody. It's our secret. I'm, I'm okay. giving away my secrets here. <laughs> I'll keep that show. secret. <laughs> yeah. So don't anybody go in the morning. All of you go at noon or three o'clock. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so back in Jesus's time, though, uh, as we go to the stations of the cross, it would have been very different struggling along and people just frustrated that he's blocking their shop and he's blocking traffic. And then imagine this poor guy, Simon Cyrene, he's coming along with this three-piece suit in his briefcase. He's got a business meeting and they grab him and they make him get all covered with blood and stuff while he's got to carry the cross. It was his, it was his unlucky day, right? He got snagged from the crowd. He looked, must have been a big guy. Hey, you over there, come over here. You got to help him. He can't carry it anymore. But it was the best thing that ever happened to him. Simon the Cyrene, because he became a Christian, and we know that yeah. his two sons became very important in the church afterwards. Okay, and so that he got the blood of Jesus on him. If you get the blood of Jesus on, you're in big trouble. If you, if you don't <laughs> want to be a Christian, and uh, who's the first ones to have the blood of Jesus splashed on him? Mary and John at the foot of the cross. The lance yeah. goes in, and blood comes out, and don't think that they didn't get it splattered on him a little bit. Um, so that that's a little bit of what it is like today and what it would have been back then yeah thank you for sharing that's ex I, I can't wait to the day i'll be able to do that uh, for, for real every catholic should probably a bit like uh, muslims have a um 
what is it, one of the, the five uh, priests of to go to Mecca. We should have yeah. a sort of a condition to be Catholic. Before you die, you must go to the Holy Land. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, can I talk about, I mean, I understand not every single station, most of the stations are biblical, but not all of them. Are you able to talk about that? Uh, um, yeah, nine of them are biblical. Okay. One, two, five, eight, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And there will be a quiz. So I hope everybody remembers that. All right, and remember that. Not found, <laughs> and the five not found in the Bible are three, four, six, seven, and nine. However, okay. they're common sense. All right. Jesus fell three times. Okay. The only one that's probably not a historical is the, is the Veronica's veil, because that tradition didn't get started till about a thousand years later. Oh, wow. And the name Veronica, very, means true, icon, which means image. So the word Veronica's image really means the true image of Christ. And there is no Veronica's veil. It is the face cloth of Christ. The, face, the cloth with his face on it is in Montepello, Italy. And that is the face cloth that was on his face when he was in the tomb. And... Yes. That was in St. Peter's, but it was stolen out of there about 500 years ago. And they still hold something up, but it's not it. The real oh, one now okay. is taken away. Somebody else bought it, and it's in Montepello. We were just there um, eight days ago, seven days ago, wow. celebrating Mass in front of that face cloth of Christ. So what happens, he's laid in the tomb, and that face cloth, they put a special cloth over his face. And in John chapter 20, when it says that Peter and John went into the tomb, and it said they saw the shroud that wrapped the body in one place, and the face cloth that was on his face was folded up in a different place. It was laying in a different place. And when they walked in, it said that they then believed. But the next verse wow. says that they had they did not yet believe, but it was when they walked in. And it's not just the empty tomb, I think, that made it. John, the face cloth of Christ is actually his eyes open. The minute of the resurrection, it's the moment when the shroud has him in death. But yes. underneath the shroud on his face, that shows the moment that he, boom, whatever that atomic burst of life was, it brought him back to life. Just like the creation power of God imprinted his face on that cloth with his eyes open the first moment he opens his eyes you could still see the wounds on his face you can still see his teeth and his little whiskers here on his face mm -hmm. and when you put the face cloth of christ up with the shroud of Turin, it's a perfect match now if you put like say okay. a mask of you and me together it wouldn't work because i think your eyes are a little wider apart and my nose is yeah. a little longer and you know there's maybe inch or difference here and it wouldn't match but those two faces when you put the shroud of torn and the face cloth of Montebello together it's absolutely a perfect wow. synchronization of the more faces. evidence and so when you see this uh, jesus's eyes open i think what happened is john went in and he was there at the last supper with his head on uh, jesus who could who had seen him closer and he was at the foot of the cross yeah. he saw jesus the last moment of his life when he breathed his last and he saw him take him down and he saw them wrap the shroud and put the space cloth on jesus and now he comes to the tomb on sunday morning and they open, he goes in and he sees that face cloth and he says, that's the Lord. His eyes are open. And it says that he believed. And because up until that point, it said they didn't believe. But I think it was the image on that cloth of Jesus with his eyes open because John had seen him with his eyes closed when that face cloth was put on. His eyes were closed and he was dead. Now, that image impressed on there. His eyes are open. John had just seen him. He said, that's him. That's a photograph of the Lord. And his eyes are open. I now believe. See, So I um, forgot how I got there. But oh, yes, oh, they're not all. Uh, we're talking about the face cloth of Christ. There's really there's not a Veronica's veil. OK, the true image, very icon, Veronica means the true image of Christ. And there was a cloth with the true image of Christ. It got called Veronica's veil because it was the true image of Christ, but mm. it's that face cloth that was on his face and that we now can see in Montepello. So you have the stations of the cross, for example, Jesus condemned to death. Okay, we know that's in the Bible, right? Jesus carries his cross. We know that's in the Bible. Jesus falls for the first time. Where do you find that in the Bible? Where does it say fall? Well, if you're carrying a 
beam of wood on your back that's yeah. 110 pounds is what they s- suggest that it weighed 110 pounds wow. and you've just the day before you've been whipped and beat bloody like we saw in mel gibson's movie and he's lost mm-hmm. all this blood then he's in a dark prison in caiaphas's house overnight without any sleep maybe up to his chest in water because it was a cistern they lowered him into we don't know whether they dropped him into the water or he was hanging all night in midair read psalm 88 and you can get an idea of what happened on that night and then you go now he's carrying this cross after he's been beat up again by the romans and he's of course he's going to stumble and fall even on the shroud of turin you see his nose his nose is mashed why because his arms are strapped to this beam of wood he trips and he falls. And what's the first thing to hit the pavement? Well, you and I would put our arms down to stop us. Right? Whoa, stop like that. But he's got his arms out. And the first thing to hit the pavement is his face. <laughs> like that. So, of course, he's going to fall. So, it, it's not said in the Bible. Jesus, Matthew 27, 18. Jesus fell three times while he cared. No, it, it's just common sense. I've had people say, well, the stations of the cross aren't biblical. Of course they are. Jesus so nine, nine out of mother. the 14 are biblical. So there you go. You right, it is. Now, number four, Jesus meets his mother. It doesn't say he meets his mother, but it does say in uh, that he meets the women, the, the yes. holy women come. Number eight. And it's, uh, yes, here we go. Number eight, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem and don't think his mother wasn't with them. Do you think mm. she, she's at the foot of the cross, right? She had to get there. Do you think That's she's right. not going to big weeping for him and i love the way mel gibson's movie does that where mary you have a flashback and she sees little jesus fall and scrape his knee and she goes running to him and falls and she helps him but now she can't help him she falls but there's nothing she can do for him so the fact that mary is there is just common sense because she's there at the foot of the cross too so jesus and then there's veronica's veil that's that's a later tradition oh and by the way it says when you pray the stations that jesus comforts the women Remember, do you remember yes. ever praying and yes. said Jesus comforts the women? That's the last thing he did. He terrified the women. He said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Days are coming when you will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nurse. They will say to the mountains, fall on us and the hills cover us. That's not comforting anybody. Nah. That's terrifying people. So that's what he told to the women that were with him. And, wow. um, and Mary was probably with them. Jesus falls a third time. I like thinking that one is as he's getting out. He probably fell more than three times, but he's getting out. He's now at the gates of Jerusalem. The, the, mm. um, it's called the Damascus Gate today. And there on the outside is Calvary, where you see by, cross is already there. They usually think that they had the upright there. and He just carried the, the patibulum, which is, and then they hoist him up and attach it. So he That's knows where he's going and he's got sweat and he's got blood in his eyes and yet he falls for the third time when he looks up there it is that where he's headed he's going to be dying on that hill wow. so yeah that some are are mentioned in the bible some are not but they're certainly common sense you, you, i just i am curious i mean you, you mentioned uh, the passion of the christ mel gibson's movie in right. that movie uh, jesus is seen to be carrying off the full cross on his shoulder yep and we yeah. sort of, um, is that more of a pious thought? Uh, or, I mean, so it sounds like in reality, it would have been this, the, the beam on his shoulder. It, 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 it's like you didn't have any manufacturer's instructions on how to make a cross. No. The Romans would sit around in the evening and say, what can we do to make this guy hurt worse than the guy that we crucified yesterday? Okay, so, so it wasn't how can consistent. We make, okay. No, I don't think there was. In, in the United States, we have something called OSHA occupational safety and health administration yeah. <laughs> where they have you know where you for manufacturing they have these requirements things have to be made just this way there was nothing like that the romans said what do we have handy here oh get that piece of wood over there drag that over here nail it to this or we already got the upright over there we'll just hoist you know, I, they put them on a tree sometimes they just nail them to yeah. a tree so there was no standardized method of crucifixion other than what's the worst and most cruel way we can do it and what materials do we have at hand that we have at hand mm-hmm. so um most people think though when you read about history it's on that he that the upright was already there 
and they would take him, he would carry the patibulum, the cross beam, they'd throw him down on the ground, nail him to it, and then with ropes hoist him up, and there was probably a way to kind of like drop into a notch where it would stay. Then they would pull that down and take it to the guy, next guy that's going to die. And so there's really no specifications for how the cross would work, but we do know he carried the cross, whether it was a whole cross or just the cross beam, we don't know. Okay. I know some okay. of the mystics have come up and, and Mel Gibson liked Anne Catherine Emmerich. And so he followed mm -hmm. a lot of her um, ideas, which I think was brilliant. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's a powerful movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask the importance of uh, praying the stations? Why is it a good idea to be praying the stations of the cross, uh, especially at this time of the season? um it's a way of making it our own it's a way mm. of entering in to it it's like i said earlier it's the difference between looking at pages pictures on mm. a in a book or going to the football game and getting all sweaty and having the ball bounce off your head at you know at one point it's it's a way that you christian life is not a um spectator sport the christian life is a participation sport if you don't get bloody and sweaty as a christian you aren't playing the game and this is a way to help us play the game in a sense it's a way that we enter into the real drama of the life of christ we weren't there when it happened but we want to be there we would love to have been there to weep for jesus or to help him or mary if we could and the stations of the cross are what we do to re prepare us for the triduum, the death and resurrection of Christ. It's also there to remind us of the horrific price that was paid for our sins. It shows us how horrible sin is. This is mm -hmm. what sin does. And this is the price to pay for the wickedness and evilness of sin. And it's a way we live that out. We practice it. And I think we need to take our kids and get them in the drama. I think too many parents, they, they just go on their own and they pray, mumble their prayers to themselves. I think it's much better to take your kids and have the kids share in this and say, what happened in here? What do you think it was really like, Johnny? What do you think? I was at mass yesterday. Um, yeah, yes. Is it Monday? Yes. No, it's Tuesday. I was at mass on Sunday with one of my grandsons. And I always wear this cross everywhere I go. So during mass, he kept looking at it and he kept saying, nails, grandpa, nails. Huh. Said, yes. He said, do you think it hurt grandpa? During that mass, 25 times, he said, do, do you think it was painful for Jesus? Did it hurt? Wow. Now, see, yeah. This is, this is a, an image. It yes. helps kids understand. He, he couldn't get over the fact. And I said, not just, not just nails in his feet and his hands, but they took a sword. And, they, and I poked him right in the ribs like this. I said, they went, and, I, and he went, oh, grandpa. I said, they stuck it right in his ribs and it went right into his heart. He said, and he said, did that hurt? And I said, of course it hurt, James. I said, if I took my big knife out of my pocket, would it hurt you? Yeah, grandpa. But why did they do that to you? Well, see, this is what the stations of the cross yeah. should be. Beautiful. Don't just take your kids and expect them to just follow you along. Get the kids involved. They're like Passover. Why do we do this, dad? Why are we doing this? And then explain to them each one of those and let the kids explain it and make a crown of thorns. I have a big crown of thorns downstairs. It's really impressive. All the kids that and even oh, wow. when their friends came over, they wanted to try it on, but nobody puts it on really. The guy says, you want to put it on? It's big thorns. Make a crown of thorns and let your kid wear that while you're going through the station to the cross and give it a little tap once in a while. Let him feel what it's like. And this, is, I, this is the way we raised our kids. I wasn't normal the way I raised my kids. I wanted my kids <laughs> to experience. I would always try to shake them out of their comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah. Guess what? I've got four kids that love the Lord and now 19 grandkids that do. praise God. But you, you got to do this kind of thing with your kids. Make it real to them. Get them exactly. involved. Drama. Drama. I love it. That's why we Thank pray you. the stations of the cross. Powerful. Thank you. Now, um, I'm not going to ask you to go um, individual because we've uh, we, we've got the whole series that's already pre-done from last year. You've got yep. you've given beautiful meditation. I will ask this, and as we've only got about five minutes here. Um, okay. So why do our usual crucifixes do 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 us great injustice? <laughs> and and sort of if we can close on, I yeah. guess, the reality here of what it really was like. Too often, the crucifix in front of a church that we see 
it's Jesus. Mm-hmm. He's just kind of sleeping on the cross. There's yeah. a little red dot, and another little red dot, and a little side, there's a little mark. And he's got a little diapers on, a little thing wrapped around his loins. And I understand why they do that. Jesus is in control. This is a sanitized way. But if you'd have been there, it wouldn't have been like that. He had no clothes on when he was there. They were they were stripped naked. And I know I'm going to get people calling me and saying, oh, no, this mystic said that they did. Mary made sure they were covered. Mary was not in charge. The Romans were in charge. They crucified people. They hung them on the cross totally naked and their bodily functions urinating. You totally lose control of everything. They're defecating and urinating while they're hanging on the cross. The birds, crows are ripping their skins out, plucking their eyes out, and they're hanging there in total utter degradation and humiliation in front of the town, in front of their families, everything. That's the whole point of a crucifixion. It's not just about pain. It's not just about agony and making it last. There's men that were kept alive on the cross for a week or longer. Can you imagine hanging on a cross for a week alive with everybody walking by looking at you and there's, you're, you're, you're not controlling your body or your functions and all this total humiliation and agony. And we, when we look at a crucifix, it doesn't look like that. <laughs> the real, the real, the way the Romans did it was not only to give ultimate punishment and degradation, totally degradate the person, but also it was a warning. Because you, Charbel, or me, Steve Ray, we walk out the gates of Jerusalem to go over to the olive field and we see those guys hanging on the cross. And it's a way of Rome saying to you, how would you like to be on there? If you defy us, that's what's going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. Be a good citizen. Shut up and do what we tell you to. Follow our rules. Pay your taxes or you're going to be up there too. It was a warning. So it had to be the grisliest, most painful form of death ever invented by the Persians in 600 BC. So we don't see that when we look at a crucifix. And Mel Gibson's movie does a pretty good job of showing it to us. But even there, you're not seeing the reality of it. You're not Mm -hmm. even seeing there. the You don't see um, Jim Caviezel naked up there hanging like jesus would have been nor do you see him losing his bodily functions and so on um i'll tell you a funny story when we were taking a group uh, the family brought their teenage daughter and she was really kind of stubborn and rebellious against her parents and when i talked about the cross what it was like i'm just describing it like this she said oh yeah right that wouldn't happen 10 minutes later she got so sick and she pooped in her pants and she threw up everywhere she totally lost control of all of her bodily functions they had to get her to taxi and take her back to the hotel and she was a different girl from then on she says wow god sure taught me a lesson i said that could have happened and it it (laughs) happened to me 10 minutes after i said it she said i'm going to listen to steve ray from now on and her mother said her daughter has never been more loving and kind to her than she it's an after that event so i mean there's there's a little interesting story there but um so you i think stations of the cross we got to try to imagine what it was really like what a Mm. roman crucifixion was really like and then we can see what the price for sin really was and how awful sin is and how much God loved us that he's willing to do it. And lastly, Jesus has the audacity. He's awful, got a lot of guts to come along and say then, Charbel, if you want to be worthy of me, you have to take up your cross and do the same thing. And if you're not willing to carry your cross and hang on a cross like that, then you're not worthy of me. That's That's pretty gutsy to tell your disciples. Absolutely. Most disciples would leave. I mean, if I if I try to get people around me and say, look, I want to be your leader, but I want, they're going to say, I'm not going to do that. That's not the kind of thing a leader asks his people to do. But Jesus does. He said, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. So that's that's another- a powerful statement. Can I invite yeah. you? I mean, thank you so much. I, I think uh, it's fitting then maybe that that uh, echoing that, that, you know, Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, ultimate act of love, um, this, this is probably a good one to really hammer home. If you could give us a final thought here as we close out this, this uh, reflection and podcast. Well, God didn't have to do it. It's called the scandal. Yeah. Uh, the, the scandal takes two steps. One is the scandal of the incarnation. He actually is willing to become a man to begin with and come down here and sweat and flies buzzing around and walking through camel dung and be in pain and hunger and thirst. And the only way I can get my kids to understand that is go do this with your kids sometime. It'll help them understand the incarnation. Go crawl through the grass, find an anthill, 
watch the ants go in and out of the ground down there carrying things you know and now and then say do you think you could ever love those ants enough to come down and be an ant like that and live in the ground with them because you love them so much and your kids will all say no never would love an ant that much <laughs> never grandpa never never and i said but if you did go down do you think that you would let those ants take you and torture you and kill you you could stop them but you don't because you love those ants so much that you let the ants tear your legs off and tear your antennas off and rip you up and bite you and everything bury you in the ground could you never grab it that's called the scandal of the incarnation coming down but then dying on the cross is called the scandal of the cross can you imagine what mm -hmm. the angels thought when they found out that god was going to do that they looked at each other the angels he's going to do what god, god's going to do what why would he do that they don't even respect him they don't even love him why is he going to go do that for them um i wouldn't have but then God's love is much more than mine. So as we <laughs> celebrate Easter and we go to the stations of the cross, remember that he didn't have to do that. It said he could have called 12 legions of angels. I calculated that 72,000 angels he could have called. They would have freed him like that. It had been over, but he didn't. He said, I love Charbel so much. I'm going to go ahead and do this for Charbel. I'm going to free him from his sins. And then I'm going to raise him up so that he can partake in the life of the Trinity and share this all with us in the Trinity. He loved us that much to go through that scandal. And I think as we go through the Passion Week and do the Stations of the Cross, remember that scandal and what he did for us. And then ask yourself, how can I sin? How can I willfully spit in his face? And we have to obey him. Wow. Mate, let that sink in. Amen. Thank you very much for sharing. This You're is welcome. powerful. It's transformative. I mean, yeah, highly encourage everyone. Uh, number one, I mean, do the stations really enter into it? We've got these uh, pre-recorded meditations from Steve Ray himself um, on our website. Link go through to uh, the Le uh, Lenten pilgrimage, and you'll see them. Uh, they're 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 free for a short time, and then you can purchase them uh, after Easter. You can own them, and then have go back and watch them sort of on a Friday if you want to make that as part of your traditional listen to them in the car or but they're very powerful uh, steve how how can people con uh, contact you again uh, just just if your very website easy catholicconvert.com that's the when website and i got all the spokes of the wheels to my store with all my books and movies and talks and another one goes off to our pilgrimages where you can see and Excellent. if people want they can go back and see movies of every pilgrimage i've done for the last 10 years and wow. you can, there's a two hour movie I've made from every pilgrimage. And then there's another spoke that goes off from catholicconvert.com. It's called resources where I've got hundreds of documents are all free. Download them on the Eucharist and Mary and the papacy, all this stuff uh, about the Bible. And that's all free. And then there's all kinds of stuff on there. And every day I post new blogs about what's going on in the world, about something in the Bible or about politics or whatever, you know, what's ever on my mind. And, um, I think it, it's fun. And uh, so that catholicconvert.com. Oh, make sure everyone go visit that website, subscribe to his email list, get in touch uh, with this man. He's a man of God. Um, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, thank you, Steve, for everything you've thank done. Thank you, Charbel. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're just, we're just uh, blessed to have, have our relationship, but, but just to be able to work in the, in, in the vineyard together like this, um across from other sides of the yeah, world the other side of the world you're already <laughs> Praise God. you're Thank already in tomorrow you're that's right tomorrow. that's right I'm yes still in yesterday yeah wednesday is here a tuesday is there so. <laughs> yeah i'm still tuesday Mate. you're in tomorrow already you're, you're a time traveler um <laughs> when when you get this put up on the site would you send me the link i'd like to share a absolutely will do okay. so i'm uh, thanks everyone for watching that's another Parisian Thank podcast. You everybody. God bless. That's Steve Ray, I'm Shabal Raish. Uh, make sure you subscribe as well to all of our other podcasts, all completely free. Thanks again. Have a very blessed Holy Week, uh, Easter Triduum, a blessed Easter to you all, and we'll see you uh, next week. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Perusia Podcast. If you've enjoyed these podcasts, please share with your family and friends. And for more information about everything Perusia, please visit our website at perusiamedia.com.